What would happen if you reflected a laser beam back in on itself? And why would you want to do such a thing? In this episode, let's take a look at a vintage laser that does exactly that. In the middle of the 1980s, the most commonly available continuous wave laser was the helium neon laser, and I have an example here on the bench. These lasers produce red-orange light at a wavelength of 632.8 nanometers with output powers of a few milliwatts. For some applications, such as particle detection and Raman analysis, however, the beam from these is much too weak to be of any use. Interestingly, however, inside of the cavity itself, several watts of optical power are actually available if only we had some way of getting at it. To show you how weak the beam from this really is, I'll just blow some smoke into it. In order to access the high intracavity power available from helium neon lasers, some manufacturers produced helium neon lasers that look like this. At the rear of the laser, everything is ordinary. We've got a high reflector at the far end here, uh, but on the output side, we have a Brewster window. And the idea is that we mount our final resonator optic external to the cavity. And what this means is we can actually access the several watts of intracavity power between the Brewster window and the mirror. Unfortunately, lasers like this don't tend to have a very long lifetime. In the early days, it was very difficult to mount Brewster windows onto lasers, and so what they used to do is just epoxy these things on. Epoxy doesn't stand up to the tests of time very well, and tends to leak helium out, and undesirables such as hydrogen in, which will ultimately destroy the laser. If I power this laser on, we can see the sickly blue glow that suggests this laser is almost up to air. This is a laser particle counting head that I stripped out of a laser particle counter circa 1987 in a previous episode. I'll link that in down below if you really like teardowns. What's really interesting about this is the laser itself. This is not a Brewster windowed laser tube. It's just an ordinary helium neon laser. It has a high reflector and an output coupler, but we appear to be looking at somewhere in the region of about a watt of intracavity light here. Um, we can see the laser beam illuminating all the dust particles in the room, and this is being videoed in full room lighting as well. If I blow some smoke into the beam, we can see how bright this thing really is. Look at that, this is absolutely spectacular. This is incredibly bright for a helium neon laser. I really want to disassemble this right down to the laser tube and the third mirror itself, but before we get into all that, let's go and check out Sam's laser FAQ and a patent and see how this thing works. So I'm on Sam's Laser FAQ here. If you've never seen this website before, I highly recommend you check it out. It has literally everything that you would want to know about lasers on there. I'll link the site in down below. So we'll take a look at this section on Sam's Laser FAQ about the particle counter that we're looking at. And it actually says in here, in this particular instance, it is not a Brewster tube, but a rather normal looking helium neon laser tube. What's interesting about this, it goes on to say, is there's an additional mirror beyond the output coupler that actually reflects the beam back into the laser. Um, which I said in a previous episode is a very, very strange thing to want to do. It can cause all sorts of instabilities in a laser when you do that. It can cause the beam to go out. If the laser's high powered enough, it will destroy it. Um, but yeah, they've managed to work around this by mounting the, the mirror itself that reflects the laser beam back in there on top of a piezoelectric crystal. And the, essentially, the piezoelectric crystal vibrates and causes the beam that's in the external cavity to be out of sync with the beam that's in the main cavity and not interfere with it in some mystical way. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting. Um, it says in here that it looks like, you know, you supply something like in the region of 175 to 350 kilohertz to this crystal to actually get the magic to happen. Um, but yeah, very, very fascinating. Um, what's even more useful in this article is it links to the patent itself. So let's go and have a look at that. So let's take a look at the patent. Here it is. Um, this was granted on 10th of June 1986 and was filed on November 17, 1983 by Particle Measuring Systems Boulder, Colorado. I've highlighted all of the relevant parts in here, so let's have a quick look. So I'll just take a look at the abstract real quick and I'll cover the main points. I'll link this patent in down below, incidentally, for anybody that really wants to read it. Um, so it begins, the laser system includes first, second and third spaced mirrors, with the second mirror being an output coupler. So what this first sentence is really saying is, we've got a helium neon laser, right? That's it. Um, and then beyond the helium neon laser, we've got a third mirror that's reflecting light back in on itself. And so it says the active cavity or laser feeds or pumps the passive cavity, which is stabilized by modulation of the third mirror by moving it backwards and forwards. So it just oscillates. And what this does is it Doppler shifts the reflected waves within the passive cavity and thereby produces frequencies that don't interfere with the stable modes in the laser itself. 
Um, that's more or less it. Uh, it says, by stabilization of the passive cavity, advantages of intercavity laser devices can be realized without incurring the practical disadvantages um, of such devices. So we'll just carry on down the patent a little bit for some more background. It says, while open cavity lasers, uh, so Brewster windowed lasers, um, have really high Q ratios, uh, such lasers have presented difficulties in utilization. It doesn't actually mention anywhere in the patent that the epoxy seals eventually fail and you get really short lifetimes out of these things. Um, but I'm sure there are other problems with Brewster windowed lasers, especially you know if you're blowing dust around inside of a cavity, if a speck of dust ends up on the actual Brewster window, it'll spoil the laser and uh, all sorts of strange things will happen as well. So further down the patent, we've got a little bit more information as well. This is actually a fairly decent patent in terms of information. Um, so it says, yeah, in a regular helium neon laser, you can have, you know, um, internal powers on the order of a watt or so um, for a tube that would ordinarily deliver about two milliwatts of uh, output power. So yeah, further down in the patent is where the magic is described. Um, this patent is really detailed. It's detailed enough that you could probably go away and build this thing, right? Essentially what they did with the third mirror is mounted on a speaker, it looks like, in early experiments. Um, and they just oscillated the speaker backwards and forwards. Uh, that's it, right? So it says the speaker can be driven by fairly low frequencies, as low as 40 hertz, for example. And experiments have shown that as long as the displacement amplitudes are sufficient to generate velocities of a few tens of centimeters per second, sufficient frequency shifting results to completely decouple the cavities. Um, so yeah, we can actually decouple our passive cavity from the helium neon laser itself. Um, very, very fascinating. A really, really interesting solution to a problem, it has to be said. Um, it says uh, further on, you know, once you've got the mirror aligned and everything, nothing really spectacular happens. Uh, but the moment you start driving the speaker, the Q value of the passive cavity is increased by a factor of 10 or more, as evidenced by an increased output from the mirror. If we scoot down a little further, we've actually got some facts and figures on this. It says, with respect to the foregoing, a 5 milliwatt multimode laser in a 30 centimeter cavity is used to drive a passive cavity with a Q value of 200, providing an energy density of 1 watt. So we've got this little tiny 5 milliwatt helium neon laser, and in this passive cavity, the moment we power up the piezo or the speaker or whatever's driving the mirror, suddenly we have about 1 watt of intracavity power that we can play around with. So we've got a really nice diagram on page four of the patent that shows exactly how this system works and it is unbelievably simple. Um, we've got up at the top here, we've, so we've got two separate diagrams. Up at the top here, we've got a helium neon laser. Uh, 62 is the high reflector. Um, 56 is the output coupler where our little five milliwatt beam would emerge. And then 54 beyond that is the third mirror that forms the passive cavity. In the diagram below, we've got an actual complete setup here. Um, so 62 again is the high reflector. 56 is the output coupler. Um, 54 is the third mirror and it is mounted in a speaker cone um, uh, that's driven by a modulator and that is literally it. Um, as long as you know the stars are aligned and everything's all correct, um, we've got this passive cavity going on where we've got about a watt of uh, helium neon laser light available to experiment with. Very, very nice. Anyway, now that we've seen how this thing all works, let's strip the thing down, mount it on the optical bench so we can see all of the parts and experiment with it. So we'll get this thing apart. We'll start by disassembling the third mirror and then we'll tackle the tube. So we have the mirror here mounted in the middle and behind this is presumably the piezo actuator for it. Connected to the mirror as well as the oscillator that we need to drive it. It turns out that the helium neon laser tube is actually threaded at one end, which is also unusual. So we'll use this tool to get it off. And there we have it, one very short, but very ordinary looking helium neon laser tube. Let's get these things on the optical bench and see if we can power it up outside of this assembly. So I'll just walk you through this setup real quick. I've got the high voltage power supply for the laser mounted here. I have the laser tube itself mounted on a sled. And then I have the piezoelectric driven mirror mounted in a mirror mount. Uh, right next to the piezoelectric mirror is the driver for that. So this is the oscillator and we'll take a look at that in a minute. And then I've got the oscilloscope probes hooked up to the back of it. So this is the oscillator that drives the piezoelectric mirror. It contains a TP1321 op amp and this is just configured as an oscillator. Uh, that's all there is to it. There's no feedback or anything in here. We've got a little power connector on the back that takes plus minus 13 volts. Um, and then we've got our output and that's literally all there is to it. So I've dimmed the lights just a little bit so we can see what's going on. I have the laser powered on here, but the mirror itself is currently powered off. Everything is all aligned uh, and we might be able to see the odd little bit of dust enter the beam there. 
Uh, interestingly, this laser is focused to a point because of the curvature of the internal mirrors. And so the beam at the exit is about a millimeter in diameter. And when we get down to the front of the mirror there, it's a very, very tiny pinprick of light. If I turn the oscillator on, we'll suddenly see this cavity stabilize and this beam will brighten right the way up. Look at that, absolutely fantastic. This is beautiful. The oscillator itself generates about 28 volts peak to peak at a frequency of 175 kilohertz. The distance between the output coupler and the mirror here is important in order for the thing to work correctly as the beam is focused to a point and it's expected that the return beam you know, approximates that same cone on its way back into the resonator. Uh, but let's have a quick look at this thing anyway. This is beautiful to watch. I could sit here all night watching this thing. As always, let's waft some smoke into the beam and see it in all of its glory. Absolutely spectacular. This is fantastic. A couple of people had asked at the end of the last video what happens if you interrupt the beam on this thing. Because this isn't a Brewster laser tube, what will happen is the beam will dim but we still have a laser beam. So this is very, very easy to align when it comes to setting this thing up. It doesn't take much to ruin the cue of this cavity. If I take a very clean glass microscope slide and insert it into the beam, we can see that the bright beam goes out and we're just left with the output from the helium neon laser. Although the intracavity power here is about a watt or so, the output from the helium neon laser is much less. If I take a coherent laser check and just test the beam real quick, we've got an output of 3.42 milliwatts. The divergence of this laser is really quite large, and this is due to the curvature of the cavity optics. It's also worth noting that the output from this is multimode in order to get three and a half milliwatts out of such a short tube. I have the beam projected onto a wall here and we can actually see the mode structure in the beam itself. If we watch for long enough, we'll see it flicker and change. I was kind of curious to see if this would work with an ordinary helium neon laser. So I have a laser here that's about five milliwatts and I have everything all lined up. If I turn the power on, we can see the beam brighten, but only ever so slightly. It kind of leads me to believe that if we were to choose a correctly curved optic to mount on the front of this piezoelectric driver, that we might actually be able to extract a decent amount of power out of this single mode helium neon laser tube. That's it for this video. As always, a huge thank you to my awesome Patreons, channel donators and subscribers. Your support makes science and engineering videos like this possible.